This is Duke University. Hello. My thanks to uh, Craig Enriquez and the Academic Council for hosting this annual faculty meeting. It gives me a chance to say my main message to the faculty of Duke University, and that is a message of my admiration and gratitude for the work you do. Uh, I see many people here who I've recently seen. I've been going from school to school holding meetings of the different faculties to talk about issues in the university. It's a little, little loud, isn't it? Uh, uh, and every one of these I go to, you're just struck over and over again by how many smart people there are here, uh, how interesting and consequential the problems are to which you've attached your curiosity, uh, how seriously you, you continue to think about the needs of your students, and how imaginatively you've come together to create new uh, uh, programs and indeed new models of education. And then if we were to throw in the searches you've staffed and the reviews you've staffed and the other committees you've had the privilege to serve on, uh, what I call your service opportunity, uh, I have to admit you guys do do a lot for Duke. If the school is flourishing, I know who we have to thank. Uh, I thought of a longish list of topics I could talk about uh, today, but I thought that what I might do is to say a word about three. First, something about our uh, financial situation. Second, something about Duke's global programs. And third, I want to say something about the way the traditional fields of study expand in importance as we enter upon new ventures. Uh, so as they say on NPR, first, let's do the numbers. Uh, two short years ago, take yourself back. Uh, two short years ago, had we been in this room in February of 2009, this would have been the state. The greatest meltdown since the Great Depression had been progressing month after month after month and had still not found its bottom. At that point, we couldn't know what further perils might lie in store for us, but given the hit that had already taken place to our endowment, it was clear that we would need to move to a new budget model, uh, a budget that would be around $100 million a year smaller than we had become used to. Now let's go back one year instead of two years. If we were in this room in February 2010, well, we all were. We were in the Nasher together. Uh, by that point, markets had stabilized and to some extent begun to mend. Coupled with the internal discipline that Duke mounted and in which you all played your part, that situation enabled us to say in February 2010 that we had closed more than half the budget gap uh, in one third of the time we had allowed ourselves in the three year walk down. So now it's one year later. Uh, in February 2011, I report, our situation continues to improve. For the calendar year 2010, DUMAC earned a return of 15.6% on our university investments. Talman Trask uh, told the Chronicle a number 13.2%. That was correct for the fiscal year that ended in June uh, 30, uh, uh, 2010, but 15.6 is the number for the year, and it may in practice be somewhat higher. Philanthropic contributions to Duke had reached their historic high of $386 million in the fiscal year 2007-08, then they fell uh, to the disappointing number of uh, from 386, they fell to 301 million in the year of the meltdown. But last year they climbed back to 346 million uh, in the fiscal year 2009-10 for an increase of 15%. With the market crash, many gifts for endowment fell beneath their initial value and so failed to throw off their anticipated revenue. But with rising markets, these so-called underwater endowments have begun to break surface again and thus have begun to throw off uh, the uh, uh, income for us that the donors intended in the first place. Uh, as of December 31st, 2009, 15 months ago, $380 million of university endowments were underwater, leading to a foregone income on the order of $19 million. But by December 30th, 2010, 235 million of the underwater endowments had come back above water, uh, throwing off anticipated income on the order of $12 million. Meanwhile, continued austerity and administrative efficiency across the university uh, have kept us on the path toward a rebased and sustainable budget, while through decanal leadership and faculty ingenuity, 
uh, school after school have cr found increased income for themselves by creating new programs, which also have value to students as well as to our bottom line. So through this combination of means, we have accomplished around two-thirds of the planned budgetary reduction. And then on the other side of the letter, uh, ledger, revenue growths have reduced the size of the remaining shortfall. And I'll give you a moment to savor this because this is good news. This is actually extraordinarily good news. And two years ago, we never could have guessed that we would be able to report such good news today. But now that I've let that sink in, I will then say that for a host of reasons, it is not time for us to loosen our restraint. You know the reasons. Having lived through several years of extraordinary volatility and unpleasant surprises, it would be profoundly foolish for us now to guess that we could now be certain about the future, let alone that the future would be a steady upward climb. Further, even with the rebound, we've not yet climbed back to where we were be, uh, when we started, and we continue to feel the drag on our, uh, from the endowment's worst performing years. In addition, if revenues and expenses have come back to something near equilibrium, if we're going we're gonna to still need spending discipline in order to create a margin for new investments uh, and new expenditures, including the compensation increase we would like to make for you in the coming year after two raise-free years. A phrase I hope will enter the lexicon. Uh, also, and now I know that this applies more to some of you than to others, our revenue sources have different drivers, and some of those have returned to health at the time that others have become newly imperiled. Federal research dollars were actually augmented by the financial crisis in the short term. The ERA stimulus bill, one of the first byproducts of the downturn, gave an unexpected lift to Duke, which ranked fourth among all universities in its competition for ERA NIH uh, uh, dollars. But as the recession wanes, and this is one of the great paradoxes of this moment, it's well known to you, as the recession wanes, the new politics of the federal deficit threatens serious reductions in federal research budgets and very likely an end to growth. Since innovation flowing from research universities continues to be one of the great drivers of the American economy, you may, may be sure that we will fervently make the case that cutting research support is a short-term fix and a long-term folly. But given current realities, none of us can be positive uh, that that argument will win the day. So you put all this together and you shake it up, and here's where I would bring it out. We have weathered the worst of the storm, but we're really not yet back on easy street. And so I'm going to need to ask you to continue the exercise of virtues you may be getting quite tired of. Through its maturity, through its self-discipline, through its willingness to set priorities and make choices, the Duke faculty has brought this university through an extraordinarily challenging time in remarkably healthy state. So let's not imperil that achievement by a premature outburst of irrational exuberance. That work that needed doing wasn't fun, but we've done it quite well. So now let's take the trouble to see it through. I attended a student forum about two weeks back at which a student asked me the following question. Why are we expanding activities overseas when we're still weathering a financial crisis at home? I ask the question here because I'm sure that many of you have had it occur to you. This is a fair question, it's an important question, and I'll answer it absolutely as honestly as I can. My answer has, a, has more than one part. First, I would say, I emphatically agree with the notion that the excellence of our core business must always be our highest priority. Second, we now understand that the successful launch of our China project will likely bring the Central University some cost. This is now estimated at between $1.5 million and $2 million a year in the first five years, an amount we hope will be reduced by philanthropy. But this is a fairly modest sum in a budget of more than a billion dollars, and it doesn't significantly trade off against other projects that we also have in mind. For scale, I would remind you that the university laid out nearly $5 million a year of strategic funds to launch the Global Health uh, Initiative, now the Global Health Institute, and one of our great recent successes. Third, I'm still answering the question, why are we doing things abroad in the middle of a, of a, a recession at home? Third, and to me this is really the heart of the matter, our global projects would indeed be distractions and follies if they were not of high strategic value. 
But if they are of high strategic value, then it's crucial that we not relinquish them, especially in lean times. The greatest threat the downturns pose for universities is to stunt forward movement and lock in the status quo. The university that fares best in such times will be the one that, while protecting existing activities and commitments, also stays alert to emerging opportunities and willing to take the steps to seize some of those. So why would our international activities be strategic? Uh, it is a truism, but for all that, it is the truth. Globalization, our code word for the interconnection and reciprocal modification of physically remote human communities along every possible axis, the economic axis, the cultural axis, the demographic axis, the climatic axis. Globalization is the most salient feature of modern reality. As places devoted to the understanding of the world and to transmitting that understanding to the rising talent of the futures, universities therefore have a fundamental stake in deepening their grasp of the globalizing world. I'll put it negatively, universities that refuse to expand their horizons at this time, I'm confident, are going to pay the price for their failure to evolve. You know the reasons why this is so, but let me enumerate. Everything I say today seems to come in four parts, and this one too. One, through the communities they assemble, universities catalyze breakthroughs and discoveries. And you know the corollary, the higher the talent you assemble, the more potent the breakthroughs that are generated. Since talent pools for faculty and students are now transnational, a university must draw the most powerful and creative minds from around the world in order to stay at the forefront of discovery. Two, intellectual work is increasingly done collaboratively in partnerships not limited by physical location. So the university that fails to build connectivity to a broad array of high-end partners is creating a new status for itself as the backwater of tomorrow. Three, uh, and maybe not everybody will agree with me about this one, but I actually feel it quite strongly. The expansion of quality higher education outside the US and the developed world is in our interest and not just in the interest of others. Education is the great unlocker of human potential. No country should wish to have a monopoly on that market. Furthermore, education trains people to work constructively on the great challenges we face together. In a world where all major problems are global, have global determinants, it won't suffice to have a few well-trained people gathered together in a few favored sites. And then fourth, we need international connectivity to teach students well even at home. One function of university through the ages has always been to de deprovincialize people, uh, to take people at, a mo at, at the age of maximum openness and throw open the world for their discovery and appreciation. And for each generation of students, the relevant horizon has become wider. So to continue to draw the best students and to give them what they need, we have to ensure that going to Duke means going through Duke. It, that going to, to Duke means initiating a mental journey into a broader world, even when they stay in classrooms here. So I've given four arguments. The argument for uh, a talent recruitment, the argument for creating connectivity for research, the argument for building uh, a, a, a cadre of educated people around the world, and an argument in favor of uh, strengthening education here. To my mind, an international project would be truly strategic to the extent that it hit these multiple targets in a fairly direct way. If you wonder how that might work, we could look at Duke's project in Singapore and you'd get a good example. In the year 2001, a study called the OXPRA report, Singapore diagnosed itself as lacking a form of higher education that it judged would be critical for its further development. This is the sort of research-based medical education that prepares for careers in biomedicine and in tra translational research. To cure that deficiency, the government of Singapore invited Duke to partner in creating a new school that would feature the Duke medical curriculum and have us uh, overseeing the appointment and recruitment of its faculty. The Duke National University of, S uh, of Singapore Graduate Medical School, which graduates its first class this May, has met Singapore's needs for human capital development, but it's also yielded many benefits for Duke. It has made our name visible across Asia as synonymous with top medical education, strengthening our lure for global talent. It has enabled us to hire faculty who wanted to be affiliated with Duke, but who had reasons for wishing to work in Southeast Asia, 
uh, deepening our expertise in certain strategic areas, emer emerging infectious diseases would be an example. The Singapore project has given us a point of connection to other research sites across South Asia, for instance in India, and it has also created a space to try out new teaching formats that have proved sufficiently successful that we're beginning to re-import them back to the mothership uh, to use them in classes here. China's extraordinary emergence as a global player would seem a sufficient reason to increase our connection there. But in my understanding, it's specifically the uh, evolution of Chinese higher education that gives us a place to plug in. China is a nation that plans on a scale and executes with a rapidity that is unthinkable in this country, and we see that in higher education as in every other sector. China determined 15 years ago that higher education was the rate-limiting factor on Chinese uh, economic and social development, and so it set out at that point massively to expand educational opportunity. Does someone care to guess the number of places that exist in higher education in 2006 as opposed to the year 1997? It increased 350 percent. And if you count the people only who are in higher education of the sort that we would consider serious higher education, the number is now 15 million students as a result of a, a, a consistent program of development. More recently, China has become convinced that the quality of higher education is as much a problem for them as quantity once was. And accordingly, China is differentially investing to build up the high end of its uh, higher education spectrum and reworking not just the size of its programs, but also their interior intellectual architecture. I've had two personal glimpses of this, project, of this uh, fact in the last uh, year that I would share with you that for me have been particularly revealing. Last April, in conjunction with the opening of the Shanghai Expo, the Chinese government gathered uh, a great international gathering of nabobs, powerful figures, celebrities, movers and shakers. Of what category would you say? University presidents from China and from elite schools around the world. If I say that such national prioritizing of higher education seems virtually un-American, I do not mean that altogether as a compliment to us. But what was so amazing about this gathering was that after sitting attentively while the presidents of Stanford, Yale, Chicago, Duke, Oxford, and others explained the foundations of our highly successful form of education, Chinese university leaders gave their own talks on interdisciplinarity, problem-based instruction, in-class debate, and other hallmarks of Western instruction, eager to display their command of international best practices. I, was, I gave such a talk, but I was on a panel on university sustainability. Uh, I went assuming it would be just be humiliating for our audience to hear about Duke's practices. People are doing things in Chinese universities far in advance of what's being done here uh, in those dimensions. One of the Chinese university presidents I have gotten to know, an educational leader as thoughtful and articulate as any I know in the world, told, told me in a private talk that China's impressive accomplishments in fields like engineering were limited by their lack of related strength in the humanities and social sciences. So I said to him, do you mean that what you now want to do is to develop top economics and anthropology departments as you once developed top computer science departments? He didn't say no, but he replied as follows. He said, what I really mean is that we are a nation with problems that will overwhelm us if we don't address them soon. We're training people in the technical ends of these problems, but to fully deal with them, we have to think them through at the level of social impact, public policy, culture, behavior, in short, in all their dimensions simultaneously. If this is the right time to increase our presence in China, it's because our partners there want what a school like Duke can provide, broad training to engage in complex problem solving for large, the larger human good. You'll recall what the first programs are that we propose to offer on an experimental basis in Kunshan. These are programs at the junction of business management, environmental management, and health. If the Singapore example holds, by projecting such Duke programs in Kunshan, we could hope to meet a global education need. Simultaneously, we could make Duke globally visible as a leader in cross-disciplinary education. Simultaneously, we could create a workspace for Duke faculty inquiry into China and a base of, for collaboration with a wide range of Chinese partners. 
and simultaneously, we would build a place for Duke students to work together with their parallel numbers from other countries and for Duke teachers to learn things to bring back to their classrooms here. We continue to make substantial progress working through the preliminaries of this project. There are lots of preliminaries to work through. Uh, we've achieved a major clarification of financial arrangements with the municipality of Kunshan. Duke experts in human relations, uh, human resources, land use, purchasing, and 100 related fields have traveled to Kunshan to avoid misunderstandings down the road. By Chinese law, a Chinese academic partner must co-sponsor the newly founded educational entity, and we appear to have found a suitable partner in Wuhan University, a top 10 school uh, that has been highly respectful in negotiations of Duke's leadership role. We've also found philanthropic support to help defray the costs of the launch. It is our hope to be able to submit the application to the Ministry of Education in March 2011 for an anticipated opening in late 2012. And Greg Jones and Peter Lang and I or whoever else are at the uh, service of the Academic Council to give updates as the situation unfolds. As we embark on this venture, we have to frankly acknowledge that China does not share this country's attitudes toward open inquiry, freedom of expression, and free access to information. Those are not trivial things for an American university. The intellectual culture we take such pride in is founded on those exact values. So not only do we need to insist on these values to the fullest possible extent as we go forward in China, as we have been doing in current negotiations, at the same time, the Chinese themselves must learn to accept and embrace these values if they are to get the worth of their bargain. Duke education is the spirit in which it is conducted quite as much as any fixed curriculum. If our Chinese partners want to recreate a world-class form of education, they'll need to grapple with the spirit as well as with the letter of our ways. For all that, to believe that we would enjoy exactly the same freedoms in China as we do in the United States would be to forget the first truth of globalization, which is we're all connected, we're all always connected, but that doesn't mean that things are the same in other places as they are at home. To be a good global citizen, we'll need to learn how to expose others to our thinking and to open ourselves to theirs and to work, figure out ways to accommodate differences without violating fundamental beliefs. I cannot guarantee that this product, project will be conflict free. We do know that we have now worked for several years with highly responsive partners and we also know that if a major conflict were to develop that could not be resolved, it would be in our power to terminate the venture. But we have to hope that this project will succeed. China and the United States have emerged very quickly to a new uh, relationship as big power competitors, but none of us can wish that the latter half of our lives will be lived in a new Cold War. Our main hope for averting such a scenario will be the existence of men and women on both sides who have been schooled to understand one another's issues and have some practice in working out accommodations of competing interests to the benefit of all. Developing that human capital will remain a key function of the great universities in future. I now close with a word on another subject. It's this. At the request of a bipartisan group of federal legislators, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences announced this morning the creation of a commission to strengthen the role of the humanities and social sciences in American life, and I have been asked to co-chair it. This news makes me say on this occasion what I hope is obvious to all, which is this. If it is important for universities to keep investing in new initiatives, it's equally important to sustain the traditional bases of liberal arts education. These forms and newer concepts like internationalization and interdisciplinarity are not mutually exclusive alternatives. They're interdependent to the deepest degree and doesn't the example of China perfectly illustrate the fact we all want to be connected with China nowadays, but if we want to have any understanding of China that's not completely trivial, not to say delusional, that won't happen without help from the study of Chinese language and Chinese philosophy and Chinese government and economic structures and the way those structures revise and the way those structures continue features from uh, long rooted in Chinese history. 
we won't know much about the uh, shape of hopes and fears in a changing China without access to Chinese literature and Chinese film and Chinese photography, not to mention psychology. And if in our China project, we become perplexed that universal human rights are neither universally practiced nor indeed universally, val universally valued, and if we then want to know where did the idea of universal human rights come from and what is its status worldwide, we would be an utter loss in answering those questions if we didn't have recourse to fields like ethics, political philosophy, the history of religion, cultural anthropology, international relations, international law. Tellingly, what the Chinese most admire in us is an educational system based on broad-based combinatory learning that we call the liberal arts. So for their own importance, as well as for the contributions they can make uh, 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 to every area of understanding, universities have to promote the health of the humanities broadly conceived. The humanities have sometimes felt ignored in the priorities articulated by modern universities, and humanists, I can say this because I am one, humanists have not always been as active as they might in communicating the value of what they do to those outside their zone. But there'll be a cost for our whole project if these fields are not kept both internally vibrant and rich in connectivity. We're lucky at Duke to have lots and lots of humanistic colleagues whose hu specialized study is conducted in such a way as to enrich understanding far from their fields. I'll mention a few, and th those of you who I don't mention will kill me. Uh, I look, uh, I see right before me, our art history professor Hans von Migrote has built on his expertise in artistic modernity to create bridges to computer science, to engineering, and to image-based fields being born in the wake of the digital revolution that we scarcely have a name for yet in Duke's Visual Studies Initiative. Divinity professor Ellen Davis, who I see up there, has excavated a forgotten environmentalism in the Hebrew Bible, showing that the covenant to be God's chosen people was also a covenant to care for the land. Through her mastery of ancient Hebrew, we learn of a long prehistory of environmental values that modern, typically secular environmental movements might well benefit from learning how to appeal to. This January, in the second winter forum, the Global Health Institute simulated a pandemic, giving undergraduates virtual experience in decision making in a situation of urgency, ethical complexity, and complex, rapidly changing so-called facts. It won't surprise you that faculty in infectious diseases and health policy had key roles in devising this exercise, but another key uh, architect was Priscilla Wald, a professor of English, expert in my own field of American literature, and a pioneering student of the role of narrative in a health crisis. When the earthquake devastated Haiti one year back, Duke faculty from many fields came together to create a shared research space, the Haiti Lab, with graduate and undergraduate students included as partners. The Haiti Lab was able to draw on expertise in global health faculty, like Kathy Walmer, who with her husband David runs a family health clinic in Haiti, it was able to draw on the expertise of uh, a legal rights scholar like Guy Uriel Charles from the law school, but the lead creators of the Haiti Lab included Laurent Dubois and Deborah Jensen, uh, who I see up there, professors of history and romance studies, meaning that Duke's research and relief efforts were grounded on the understanding of Creole language and history and culture, and I did find it a striking fact that the Haiti Lab was given its home in the Franklin Humanities Institute. I pause to note the following. The Winter Forum, the Haiti Lab, and the Visual Studies Initiative, they're all amazing examples of humanistic knowledge extending itself into apparently distant areas to uh, the benefit of the understanding of all. And I would just underline, like the Kunshan Program, the Winter Forum, the Haiti Lab, and the Virtual Studies Initiative were all created during the recession and not shut down uh, be because of the recession. I conclude with this. Since I've spoken in praise of the humanities, I will actually conclude by reciting a piece of a poem to you. You may know it. It is by Wallace Stevens, the great poet and insurance leader of Hartford, Connecticut. It comes from a poem called North's Notes Toward a Supreme Fiction, where Stevens writes this. He had to choose, but it was not a choice between excluding things. It was not a choice between but of. 
He chose to include the things that in each other are included, the whole, the complicate, the amassing harmony. Given finite resources, Duke II is always having to choose, but it's not a choice between excluding things. Arts and sciences, here and abroad, established programs and new initiatives, traditional disciplines and cross-disciplinary inquiry all have their place in a great university, so our task is appropriately to support each, and then at best, to put them all in the most illuminating interrelation, to build the whole, the complicate, the amassing harmony of a true university. Money is scarcer than it was at the peak, but our project has never been to have tons of money. Our project has always been to build the liveliest, the most comprehensive, and the most searching place of inquiry we can possibly envision with whatever resources we have at hand. My thanks to you, to you for your work in our common task. Thanks. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.